Our theme tonight is Compassionate Choices, depicting our belief that compassion and respect for diversity are the most important tools we have for negotiating our differences. Our featured speaker is especially qualified to address this topic. Dr. Daniel C. McGuire is Professor of Moral Theological Ethics at Marquette University. In his most recent book, Sacred Choices, The Right to Contraception and Abortion in Ten World Religions, Dr. McGuire reveals that at the essence of every religion is a respect for choice. We are so pleased that Dr. McGuire is able to join us this evening. Please welcome Dr. McGuire. Thank you. I, I love introductions. They're always laudatory. There's no way they could say a bad word about you. Adley Stevenson pointed out that you hear so much praise when you're being introduced, that, but he added, it'll do you no harm as long as you don't inhale. <laughs> but I, I want to confess that I, I do inhale. <laughs> I, I just sit there lapping it up, and uh, it's, it's very addictive. I find myself living from one introduction to the next. <laughs> it's like, like getting to hear your eulogy while you're still around to enjoy the party. I enjoyed it so much, I thought I might just continue with the introduction. <laughs> there are a few things you were not told. In fact, one of them is misrepresented in your program. I have a degree. I'm not ashamed of it. It, it took six years of postgraduate study to get it. All of it at the Gregorian University in Rome. All of it in Latin, the lectures, the exams, the textbooks, everything else. I'm, I'm right out of the Middle Ages, why you needed that. <laughs> I have no idea why San Diego called me forward. But when I finished this six years, they gave me a degree, the Latin for which is Sacre Theologiae Doctor. The initials, therefore, you'll see are STD. <laughs> it's very nerve-wracking when I go into a hospital and there are big signs, stamp out STDs. I'm saying, no, give me a chance. But I want to say to you tonight, I, I want to say that I give you my seven reasons why Planned Parenthood is the most pro-life organization in the United States of America. I cannot for the life of me understand why Planned Parenthood is considered so controversial, why it is hated why it is threatened, why it is attacked. Now, everybody on all sides of the spectrum are, would like to see fewer abortions. I would never say to my undergraduate women, I hope you have a good life, good relationships, good professional experiences, and gosh, I hope you throw an abortion or two in there to round it out. <laughs> no, it's, it's a negative good in conflict situations when necessary, uh, and it is not something that we want to see more of. We'd like to have better sex, comprehensive sexual education, better facilities and better openness, etc. But Planned Parenthood, how do they do it? Oh, you say they hand out condoms and so Now, what Planned Parenthood hands out to every woman and every man who cross uh, under their portals are the two indispensable prerequisites of human life. You see, I'm saying there are only two things we need. Now, some of you are saying he should have stuck with the introduction because <laughs> I can think of a bunch of things we need. Now, uh, ultimately, they're all going to be covered under these two things. The one things that not one of us can do without are respect and hope. The opposite of respect is insult. The opposite of hope is paralysis. And Planned Parenthood hands out the two best contraceptives imaginable, respect and hope, to all of their people. Secondly, uh, Planned Parenthood is pro-life because it is pro-woman in a misogynistic culture. Now, I don't like the word misogyny because it's, it's actually an evasive word. It's beautiful if you live in Athens because it comes from the two Greek words, misane to hate, and gune, woman. So let's call it, 
We live in a culture which is characterized by a profound hatred of women. <laughs> now, does that sound too strong? Let me offer a little, a little proof. Back in 1973, Science Magazine published a study where they had brought in a bunch of chairmen, all guys, from universities and colleges. They wined them and dined them and tested them all day, and they, they didn't know what the tests were all about. One of the tests was to pass 200 dossiers, fictitious dossiers, of uh, professors. And they said, evaluate them, zero to 10. Well, these guys do that for a living, so they had a great time. Oh, sevens, eights, nines, whatever. The trick, however, was that they would occasionally pass through the exact same dossier they had before, but the name had changed from John to Diane. And with a formidable regularity, the grades plunged. Now, when those men went home from that day, I don't think when their car pulled into the driveway that their wife and daughters looked out and said, oh, God, here comes that chauvinist pig. <laughs> no, they said, uh, Dad's home. But we could rush in with our floppy disk and say, he is a chauvinist pig, Mom. The very sight of your gender on a piece of paper so filled him with thoughts of inferiority that he made a jackass out of himself, and we nailed the rascal. <laughs> That's in us. It's what, what theologians call original sin. It's bred into your system. How many sexists are in this room, that is, who believe in the inferiority of women? Take a head count and don't leave anybody out, including me. It's so woven into us. Be aware of it and work against it. It's a never-ending battle. Think of the fact that anthrax scares have been going on for 10 to 15 years in Planned Parenthood clinics. No one in this woman-hating culture noticed or cared until it started to affect the boys. I'd say hatred is a good name for that. If you're willing to let people die, exercising their constitutional rights. And what I'll be talking about in a moment, the, the, we have allowed the religions of the world, those systems that we consider sacred, to be distorted so that their pro-choice content would not be seen so that we could control women and subordinate them and limit their human rights. I would call that hatred. I would also say that phrase, abortion on demand, is a perfect example of this hatred. I call that phrase a sexist ellipsis. Something's left out. You see, there's a verb, demand, and there's an object, abortion. But the subject is left out. It's abortion on the demand of a woman. And that changes it. And that always gets the lowest ranking in surveys and polls. It raises so many questions. Why does a woman have to demand it? Aren't women the primary cherishers of life and the species? Aren't men the violent creatures? How many of you walking down a dark street recently and heard a couple of young people behind you turned around and said, oh, thank God, it's guys. I was afraid it was girls. <laughs> so the, the hatred is there, but the hatred is not in Planned Parenthood. Number three, you are pro-life because you are pro the health of the planet. Harold Dorn, a biologist, said that no species can reproduce without limit. There are two biological checks for that. One is a high mortality, and the other is a low fertility. And we are the only species who can choose the low fertility, proving that there is nothing more human and more glorious than family planning. Number four, you are pro-life because you are defenders of that beautiful thing called the First Amendment. First Amendment is usually glibly summed up with separation of church and state, which means nothing. The early, many of the early founders and framers of the Constitution were church-going folk. You can see that if you read uh, David McCullough's uh, story of John Adams. It's very clear that he would be described as a, as a Christian church-going guy. No, what they wanted to do was this. They wanted the new republic that they were founding not to be a theocracy, but to be a democracy. What is a theocracy? Think of Iran, for example. A theocracy is where public policy is based upon alleged divine inspiration, not upon reasoned discourse. And that's the way it is, certainly, in Iran. A democracy is a place where it is not based upon alleged divine inter inter uh, intervention or revelation, but upon the reasoned discourse of citizens reflected through elected officials. That's what they wanted the country to be. So I said one example of a theocracy is Iran. The other one, obviously, is the United States of America. 
because the First Amendment in areas of sexual and reproductive health has simply failed. Remember 40 years ago, a um, Catholic senator running for president had to go down and tell the Baptist down in Houston that if he were elected president, he would not allow the Pope to establish national policy for the United States. How ironic that 40 years later, a president from Texas says, that is exactly what I will do. <laughs> in fact, he consulted with the Pope on stem cells. And the Pope is delighted with our national policy on stem cells. A policy which, by the way, is absurd. And a policy which... A policy which is not based at all on the best insights and thinking of any of the world religions. The Pope's position is an idiosyncratic corner and he lives there with the President of the United States. <laughs> the traditions held, St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, for example, two of the major shapers of the Christian tradition, Augustine held that the early embryo has the moral status of a plant, of a vegetable. Later on, as it develops, it acquires the moral status of an animal, and then they weren't sure, Thomas Aquinas said somewhere around three or four months, it is sufficiently developed. And they didn't have embryology to help them, but they knew it wasn't there. What they knew is what, just like in the process of evolution, pregnancy is like the process of evolution in miniature. Early on in the evolutionary process, we weren't there. You might say we were there potentially, but there's a huge difference between actuality and potentiality. After all, I'm, I'm potentially dead. Please don't act accordingly. <laughs> so it, it's, it just simply goes against even the insights of the uh, tradition. Now I always say that when you take the truth out to lunch, you're going to have a nice afternoon. You won't be embarrassed. But if you're working on a false premise, you're going to get very embarrassed. And this premise, which by the way is driving our scientists now back to England. We fled England to get religious freedom long time ago. Now we've got to go back there to do scientific research because you can't do it in Theocracy USA. That's a horror. But back to the idea of how embarrassing it is if you're wrong. Uh, the stem cell view, the official policy of the United States, means several things. It means that the, as soon as uh, Bush declared that policy, the population of the United States increased by 11 million. Just like that. That's just an estimate of how many of these embryonic cells. Remember, we're talking about a collection of cells about the size of a period at the end of a sentence. And we're calling that and treating that as a citizen of the United States. That's crazy stuff. Another indication that it might be wrong is, well, maybe if it were right, it would help. You may not have declared enough dependence in your uh, <laughs> last thing because there might be a couple of citizens there you didn't even think about. Also, if the conception occurred over in Italy, do you have a little Italian in there? <laughs> and finally, shouldn't we get, and I think Ashcroft would be in favor of this, shouldn't we have um, a search warrants for the menstrual flow of sexually active women just to see if there are some citizens in there? The fifth reason I would say Planned Parenthood is pro-choice is because they are pro a virtue which is very rare in modern culture, and that virtue is courage. My old buddy Thomas Aquinas put it this way. He said, courage is the precondition of all virtue. To put that into a more modern parlance, what Thomas was saying was, you are not a decent or a moral person if you cannot take risks for people's basic human rights. And the right to control your fertility is basic. Those who assist as our honoree this evening and, and give this uh, right to women at great risk are courageous, courageous people. There's a wonderful group of young people, some present here, medical students for choice. Support them in every way you can. When I spoke to some of them out at Madison, uh, at the university there, 
One of them told me that she had spoken to a woman physician in Illinois who was the only provider in a certain area. And the woman physician said that she was thinking of um, getting a bulletproof vest, but she decided against it because she said they would find out about it, and if they shot me, they might aim for my head and leave me just a vegetable still alive. That's just one little anecdote from practicing medicine in theocracy USA. Even in my protected academic life, I felt some of the sting that comes and the danger that comes. One time, two members of the FBI came to my home, and this happens when you're a professor because some student is, former student is getting a job and they're doing a background check. And so I sat them down in the living room. I said, what can I do for you? And they said, well, there's been a threat to the life of uh, Justice Blackman on the Supreme Court. I said, well, how could I help you with that? They said, it was signed Dan McGuire, Marquette University. I said, I don't sign my death threats. <laughs> they said, I said, well, do you think I did it? And they said, no, we think it was a group called the Army of God, but we decided at the FBI that you should know that those people don't like you. And you should take certain precautions, like not parking your car in your driveway. I had a, my son then was seven or eight years old, and I started walking him to the bus in the morning and waiting for him in the afternoon. I just got a little taste of the kind of threats and terror that many of you in this room face on a daily basis. Number six, you're pro-life because you're pro-sex. You are defenders of the beauty of human sexuality and of the dignity and glory of sexual pleasure. And the seventh reason why I praise you as pro-life is that you're pro another neglected virtue, you're pro-honesty. There's a tremendous amount of double think when it comes to abortion in this culture, a lot of hypocrisy. One summer I taught out at a Catholic university uh, for a three week course. And uh, I went into the office one day to get my mail, and the old-time Catholic secretary was there. And she, uh, a, she had a woman visitor. And the, the subject came around to abortion. And the secretary started, oh, abortion? We Catholics are totally opposed to abortion. It's terrible. And she gave this little spiel, kind of a little record I could tell she had played many, many times. Well, the visitor left, and I couldn't resist the moment. And I went over and I said, I heard you talking about abortion. Oh, yes, and she was going to play the record for me. <laughs> And I said, well, no, you know, I teach in my classes here at St. John's, Notre Dame, Marquette. I teach that at times abortion is a thoroughly reasonable and thoroughly moral decision. Then there was a pause. She looked around and said, my niece. And I then heard the story of an abortion that she approved of 100%. All I had done was lift the veil of hypocrisy, socially imposed, you might say. I don't know whether the veil went back later. But there's a lot of that out there, a lot of people who agree just as much as we do. What I'm hoping is happening certainly to American Catholicism, it would help, is that American Catholicism might become Italian. <laughs> Italians, they sent me over to Rome to get my funny degree to tighten me up and make me more rigid. It had the very opposite effect. Uh, you could see the mentality in Italy um, when the Omane Vitae uh, encyclical came out condemning all birth control, even though the Pope's personally appointed committee of 44 people voted 40 to 4 to say we were wrong on contraception. That's, that's, that's little known fact, but that's, that's the fact. But when he came out and said it was all wrong, there was a cab driver in Rome who was doing the Vatican beat that day, and he heard all these priests getting on who were all excited about the controversial encyclical. And finally he asked one, goes to suggest, so you know what, what happened? And the priest said, well, the Pope came out today and condemned the pill. And the cabbie shook his head disconsolately and said, why did they tell him about it? It would obviously make no sense at all to him. He was not going to pay any attention to it. He liked the Pope. The Pope wasn't poping good that day, and <laughs> somebody got him into a mess. I'm hoping even that one of the good effects of the current unveiling of the horrendous scandals that have been kept under wraps in the Catholic Church regarding clerical uh, misconduct and crime 
I'm hoping one effect will be the realization that the bishops of the church have no charism of leadership. And they're working very hard to prove that. And leadership in these churches must begin to arise from the people and not from those who think they're inspired. Finally, to the Project Sacred Choices, because I'm very anxious. I do not look out here and see 1,400 people tonight. I hope I'm looking at a half a million people because you all have voices and the capacity to communicate. Here's the message. That book was written, I worked with uh, 14 other scholars on that for a period of three years, the book Sacred Choices. And here's our basic uh, thesis. We are saying the old dichotomy, who's right? The no choice, or the so-called pro-lifers or the so-called pro-choicers, wrong, wrong question. First of all, any issue of life and death enters into religion. The sense of the sacred is evoked when we're dealing with the mysteries of life, death, birth, and so on. So it's a religious question. So we looked at all the world's religions and showed that you can find both readings there. The world religions were begun at a time when people, we were running out of people. The prehistoric persons lived on the average of 18 years, ancient Greece 20 years, ancient Rome 22 years. Augustus Emperor at the time, the beginning of Christianity, only four out of 100 people could dream of reaching 50 and fewer when you, for women because they died of, of childbirth. Religions born in that period would have a strong natalist thrust, right? Fertility would be the most highly. So would you find in all of those religions a strong stress for fertility and natalism and a hesitancy about contraception or, or abortion? Of course you would. You can find that in all of them, more or less in various degrees. But what we demonstrate is you can also find equally orthodox, equally faith-based, equally grounded, the recognition that every one of those religions had that fertility, which is such a blessing, can become a curse and something has to be done to block it. And so they started working with their technologies for contraception and also for abortion. Abortion was an established art in as much as it was developed at the time in the world in which Christianity was born. And it was going on all of that time. And yet it wasn't condemned. Interestingly, the first person in, in the Roman Catholic tradition to write on abortion was a man named St. Antoninus. Now, I've put Antoninus four times into the New York Times, and I want to make him even more famous. He was a Dominican monk, the, monk, the Archbishop of Florence, and Antoninus wrote the first extensive treatment on abortion, and guess what? He was pro-choice for early abortions when necessary to save the woman's life, a huge category in the medical conditions of his day, a huge category. So what did they do with Antoninus? Archbishop writing stuff like that. When he died, they canonized him a saint. So we have a pro-choice saint up there. I'm out to find statues of Saint Antoninus, and I want to send them to all the Catholic bishops in the world, and an extra big one to the Pope. And I want to say before you open your mouth on this subject again, pause and say a prayer to your saintly pro-choice predecessor. Now that's our main theme, that it is basically there, it's, it's a solid thing in all of these religions, not just one, two, or the other. We're going to have another book come out on this from Oxford University Press where all the original papers will be there. We intend to really move this message and you are the people that will help us do that. But what are the, what are the uh, reactions when you come to, how does this affect law? If we can show, as we have, that all these religions have strong, solid, orthodox, traditional, pro-choice positions in them, that there's a perfectly legitimate option for any member of those things, how should the law handle it? Here's how the law should handle it, exactly the way they handle war. Take Christians. Christians, for example, could look at the scriptures and they would find Isaiah saying, you will uh, take that sword and beat it into a plowshare. You will not teach war anymore. Come to the New Testament, the Christian scriptures, and turn the cheek if someone hits you. Could you not read that as to be a perfect pacifist? Yeah, there are a lot of Christians have read it that you could never go to war, couldn't defend yourself, and this. That's one possible reading. It's a very rigorous one. There's another possible reading. And a lot of Christians have read it to say, no, you can go to war when there's serious reason for it in self-defense. So how do we handle that in the polity? We say, well, those of you who hold to the most rigorous view, that's your privilege. And we will give you conscientious objector status so that you will never have to go to war. 
Those of you who hold the more moderate view, as the way it's often described, you can defend yourself in uh, circumstances that you agree with. So everybody's happy. Bring that over to abortion. Those who read the tradition in that extremely rigid way as to say that all abortions are evil should never have to have one, obviously, and should never have to participate in them if they are medical personnel. But they could be given conscientious objector status to honor their consciences. The rest who hold what I'm calling the moderate view from all of these traditions should be honored in their conscience and no legislator should try to interfere in their religiously uh, grounded civil rights. I'll conclude with a, a message from my mother. My mother, whom we called Cassie, she had about four years of education, but she is beyond any doubt the major intellectual influence on my life. And Cassie had this philosophy, and it's very important for all of you doing the kind of work that you're doing. She had the idea that in any human setting where there was no fun, that activity was a failure. It was destined to wash out. And she was just convinced of this. Uh, one time I was, when she was in her 90s, and uh, my brother Joe, uh, a priest, I had been a priest, He's, there were three of us priests in our family, Joe was the, well, the survivor in priesthood. <laughs> the rest of us wanted to earn the title father in another way and <laughs> enjoyed it thoroughly. So I was back, i just come back from a meeting and I was gonna take over care of Cassie for two weeks while Joe went on vacation. And I was all excited about this meeting. I said, oh, so-and-so was there and this one was there and my brother was interested and we were gibbering away about all this. After about 15 minutes of this, Cassie sitting in the corner of the couch said, was there fun at that meeting? Because <laughs> in her mind, she wouldn't put it this way, if there wasn't fun, it was bullshit. <laughs> and you know, 20 years later, I don't even remember what meeting it was, but I'm still quoting Cassie. Uh, Cassie is supported by another one on the same theme, Gilbert Chesterton, the English writer, who once said, if you want to be serious, be serious about your necktie. But in really important matters like death, sex, and religion, there will be mirth or there will be madness. And I conclude with a poem by the William Butler Yeats, who is my favorite poem in all the world, The Fiddler of Dooney, makes the same message that Chesterton and Cassie were making. It goes like this, when I play my fiddle in Dooney, folk dance like a wave of the sea. So you can see the fiddler has a pretty good impression of himself and his, his fiddle. My brother is priest in Kilvarnet, my cousin in Machnabui. So all of a sudden, the poem's getting a little confusing. He's bringing in the clerical relatives. I met my brother and cousin. They read from their book of prayer. I read from my book of songs that I bought at the Sligo Fair. So the brother and the cousin were good men, but a little on the serious doer side, as the Irish would say. When we come to the end of time, to Peter sitting in state, he will smile on the three old spirits. He'll bring them in and cheer them up, the other two, but he'll call me first through the gate. For the good are always the merry, save by an evil chance. And the merry love the fiddle, and the merry love to dance. And when the folk there spy me, they will all come up to me, saying, here is the fiddler of Dooney, and they'll dance like a wave of the sea. Thank you.